I've been a preacher for more than 30 years. I've studied and taught through the book of Genesis many, many times in churches all around the world. And I've trained pastors in the skills of interpreting text. There are a plethora of powerful entities in the Hebrew scriptures bumping up against each other in competition for resources and hegemony. And they do have geographical bases. So we have the El of Egypt, Achech. We have the El of the Amorites. We have the El of your ancestors when they lived in Mesopotamia. We have the El of Ekron and that crazy competition between Yahweh and the El of Ekron, the powerful one of Ekron. There's a moment in Daniel chapter 10 when Michael, the powerful one, the warrior, shows up and says, I had a terrible time getting here because I had to go into battle with the powerful one of Persia. And so they're all associated with geographical areas. So if you've got El of Ekron, El of Persia, it would make sense. We might have El of the mountains or El of the plains. And again, it reinforces this picture of human colonies governed over by their powerful ones and the humans being sent out to war against each other on behalf of the powerful ones, conflicting with one another over Project Earth and Project Humanity. For hundreds and thousands of years, people around the world have turned to the Bible for information about God. Two scholars, Mauro Bellino and Paul Wallace, argue for a radically different interpretation. Seeking out the root meanings of key words in these ancient texts, they find another, quite different story emerges. One with enormous implications for our understanding of the human race and our place in the universe. For more than two millennia, readers have interpreted the ancient texts of the Bible as stories of God, a seamless narrative in which God creates the heavens and the earth, botanical and animal life, and eventually the human race. However, a number of anomalies in the texts, along with intriguing questions of translation, point to another possibility. Paul Wallace is an internationally best-selling author, researcher, and scholar of ancient mythologies. Over the last decade, Paul's work has probed the world's mythologies and ancestral narratives for the insights they hold on our origins as a species and our potential as human beings. As a senior churchman, Paul served as a church doctor, a theological educator, and an archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia. Paul's work in church ministry has included training pastors in the interpretation of biblical texts. His work in biblical translation and interpretation has revealed a forgotten layer of ancient story, with far-reaching implications for our understanding of human origins and our place in the cosmos. Mauro Bellino is an internationally best-selling Italian author, researcher, and highly regarded scholar of ancient Hebrew. For many years, he worked for Rome's St. Paul Press as a Bible translator, providing with great precision the literal meaning of Hebrew words for Vatican-approved interlinear Bibles. It is an exacting discipline. The scholar must be rigorous in avoiding any kind of interpretation of the word and give only the literal etymological meaning of each word part. Morrow's findings set him at odds with the conventional expectations of the Catholic world and propelled him onto the international stage where his work has opened up a world of cultural memory recorded in the Bible. Yet hidden from the public for centuries by mistaken translation and the dogmas of the church. Together, Morrow and Paul show that the root meanings of a series of key words in the Bible reveal an earlier layer of information very different to the story of God associated with the Bible. Hidden plain sight in the pages of Genesis is an even more ancient narrative, one which reframes the whole story of human beginnings.
Good morning to all. Paul and I continue with the suggestions for reading the Bible in a respectful way and out of any discussion on translations. Today's suggestion is about the term Almighty that appears a few times in the Old Testament. The first time is in Genesis 17, when one of the Elohim presents himself to Abraham and says to him, I am God the Almighty, walk before me and be perfect. I will place my covenant between you and me, etc., etc. The other times it is mentioned in Genesis 28, 35, 43, 48, 49, in Exodus 6, in Numbers 24, in Ruth 1, in Psalms 68 and 91, in Job 5, in Joel 5, in Isaiah 13, Ezekiel 10. Most of the times is it therefore mentioned in Genesis, so let's go and examine it. So, I am God the Almighty. In Hebrew it says El Shaddai with the dot that doubles the letter D. What the exegesis of the Jerusalem School of Bible Studies says This is the Jerusalem Bible, and it says exactly that. The common omnipotent translation, followed by the CEI Bible, that is the Italian Episcopal Conference, is inaccurate. The text says Almighty. The note says it is a wrong translation. The meaning of Shaddai is uncertain. God of the mountain has been proposed according to the Akkadian shadow. It will be preferable to interpret God of the step according to the Hebrew Sade and according to another meaning of the Akkadian word. So the text says omnipotent. The note below says that omnipotent is wrong and could mean either L of the mountain because translating L with God is also an artificial translation. L of the mountain, or better still, L of the step. I remind you that Paul and I talked extensively about the terms L and Elohim in our previous videos. You understand that between L of the mountain L of the step and Almighty, there is a big difference. It is enough to read the Bible to understand that Yahweh was anything but omnipotent. Just read a few books is enough to read a few books of the Bible to understand how many are the limitations of Yahweh. God must necessarily be Almighty, therefore Almighty must also be there somewhere. But if uh, these uh, two elements of uncertainty weren't enough, I had a third, and uh, the third is this. Some dictionaries, such as Brown Driver Briggs, one of the most important in uh, Biblical Hebrew, connect the term Shaddai with the verbal root Shaddad. That has a precise meaning. It is connected to the concept of violence. It says the meaning is to act with violence, to devastate, to ruin. This other dictionary of Biblical Hebrew regarding the verb Shaddad translates to devastate, to massacre, 
to destroy and so on. As you can see, all meanings related to violence. And for what it concerns the term Shaddai, it says divine name still uncertain. Divine name, obviously, because it refers to El, which is artificially translated with God. So, if we take this meaning, there is a consideration to make. This El, who presents himself to Abraham, could have said to him, he could, obviously, I am a violent El, so be careful what you do. Walk in front of me and be perfect. This statement could really be understood as a warning. Dear Abraham, be careful what you do, because I am violent. In fact, it is enough to read the Bible to understand that these meanings that we have read, that is extermination, devastation, etc., were normal for Yahweh. Just think of the genocides, infanticides, were committed in the Bible to understand that this could also be one meaning among those possible. However, the goal of these uh, videos with Paul is not to find a meaning, to contrast the meanings, but to read the Bible in a respectful way, avoiding any useless discussion because the meaning is uncertain. And then we avoid useless discussions. When we find omnipotent or uh, almighty in uh, English, we write Shaddai, and we read it like this, without asking ourselves what it means. It will help us to understand the Bible, regardless of the meaning we want to give to this term. So, let's do this replacement. Indeed, to be more precise, when we find God the Almighty, we put El Shaddai, so we also avoid translating the word El with God, because this too is an uncertain translation. And now, let's listen to Paul. In the meantime, I send you my greetings from Italy. Hi, Paul! Ciao, Mauro. Davvero mi sto godendo la nostra collaborazione. And I really enjoy the way you shine light on these ancient texts and these questions of translation. It opens up a whole new realm for people to explore. Now, this time around, we're looking at the concept of Almighty God and the word El Shaddai. Now, for ages, believers have wrestled with the idea of Almighty God. Now, I've said in other places how I really like how the Apostle Paul defines God in a speech he gives to a non-religious audience in Athens in Acts 17, where he describes God as the source of the cosmos and everything in it, that in which we all live and move and have our being. And personally, I like that explanation of what God means. But through the ages, religious thought has run with another conception of God, conceiving of God as a very powerful entity or an almighty being. And that conception of God has thrown up some problems for believers because if God is a being, if God is an almighty entity, then why doesn't God fix all the problems? Why doesn't God divinely magic everything better when that's what's needed? And those are the kinds of questions, the questions of suffering that believers have wrestled with through the ages. And it's thrown up by this conception of God as an almighty being. Now this time around, we're looking at the name El Shaddai. And when you come across that word in English translations, what you usually find is the almighty or Almighty God. And so everywhere this name occurs, this conception of an Almighty being is repeated and reinforced. Mauro and I are arguing 
that that is not the correct translation of this name, that it doesn't mean God and it doesn't mean Almighty God. Last time, you'll remember when we looked at Yahweh, Mara mentioned this moment when Pope Benedict XVI sent around a communication to the Catholic world telling Christians not to use the name Yahweh in Christian prayers and liturgies because he said it is not a Christian name for God. Now just pause and think about what the Pope was telling us there. Now Pope Benedict XVI was probably the most conservative Pope in my lifetime. And yet he's saying something very, very radical. Yahweh is not a Christian name for God. Now you could take that in two ways. He could be saying it's not a Christian name for God, it's a Jewish name for God. But what's the issue there if it's the same God that we're worshipping? Is he saying that it's not a name for God at all? And that was the conclusion we came to last time. Now the name Yahweh in the scriptures as we have them and we're talking about the final redaction of the Hebrew scriptures made sometime in the 6th century BCE, that redaction puts Yahweh and El Shaddai alongside each other as names for the same entity. They are very closely associated. But what does El Shaddai mean? I'm going to argue that El Shaddai does not mean God, and it does not mean Almighty God. You find it translated that way in English translations, in Spanish translations, it is Dio, Todo Poderoso, which means God, the all-powerful, the God who can do anything. In French, it's l'Eternel. In Italian, it's l'Eterno. But what does it mean? I'm going to argue it doesn't mean the Eternal and it doesn't mean the Almighty. It's another word translated as God that shouldn't be. So far, we've seen Elohim, Elion, Yahweh, and today El Shaddai do not mean God. Perhaps like the word Yahweh, El Shaddai has made a journey through the Hebrew Scriptures that it comes to be used to mean Almighty God, but in the beginning it meant something else. So let's go back to the beginning, back to where we first come across this name in Genesis 17. And when Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me, before my face, and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly greatly. So there we have the writer equating Yahweh with El Shaddai. Yahweh appeared and said, I am El Shaddai. Remember, though, that the name Yahweh was not revealed until the time of Moses, in an age far later than the age of Abraham. So what's Yahweh doing in the text at all? Well, again, this is a clue that we are reading not the original telling of the story, someone after the time of Moses, who knew the name of Yahweh, is retelling this story using the name that was later revealed. And it's being done to glue Yahweh into the text so that the reader perceives Yahweh as being involved from the very beginning. And this point is made emphatically in Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, where the text says this, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I appeared as El Shaddai, but I did not make my name Yahweh known to them. So there the redactor is explaining what the post-Moses name is doing in the pre-Moses text. And he is equating these two names. He's saying this is the same entity, Yahweh and El Shaddai, are two names for the same entity. Now, last time we saw that Yahweh really was an entity, not God. So what is the case with this name, El Shaddai? Now, I'm going to go to the footnotes in the New Jerusalem Bible because they're rather interesting. 
I take my hat off to the New Jerusalem Bible. I love the transparency with which it tackles some of the translation issues around the names for God. And in the study editions, the editorial notes and the footnotes are really very, very useful. The senior editor, Dom Henry Wandsborough, was very helpful to me when I was doing my research for my book, Escaping from Eden. And that is not to associate him with my conclusions. I'm in no way saying he endorses everything I say, but he was very helpful pointing out some of the journeys that these words may have made through time and what the original meanings may have been. So let's go to the footnotes over the appearance of El Shaddai in Genesis 17, the first mention. It says, El Shaddai, an ancient divine name of the patriarchal period, preserved mainly in the priestly tradition, see Exodus 6.3, which we just read, rarely used outside the Pentateuch except Job. The usual translation, Almighty God, is inaccurate. There it is, is inaccurate. The meaning is uncertain. God of the mountain from the Arcadian Shadu has been suggested, but perhaps God of the open wastes would be preferable from the Hebrew Shadeh, and it is the secondary meaning of the Arcadian word. It seems to have been a divine name brought from Upper Mesopotamia by the ancestors of the race. So the editors of the New Jerusalem Bible are saying that this name, El Shaddai, suggests a powerful one with a regional jurisdiction, a powerful one of the mountains or a powerful one of the plains, of the open wastes. Now, is there any kind of a framework that would make sense of that? Yes, there absolutely is. Because as we've seen before, there are a plethora of powerful entities in the Hebrew scriptures bumping up against each other in competition for resources and hegemony. And they do have geographical bases. So we have the El of Egypt, Achech. We have the El of the Amorites. We have the El of your ancestors when they lived in Mesopotamia. We have the El of Ekron and that crazy competition between Yahweh and the El of Ekron, the powerful one of Ekron. There's a moment in Daniel chapter 10 when Michael, the powerful one, the warrior, shows up and says, I had a terrible time getting here because I had to go into battle with the powerful one of Persia. And so they're all associated with geographical areas. So if you've got El of Ekron, El of Persia, it would make sense. We might have El of the mountains or El of the plains. Is there anything else that would reinforce that reading? Yes, there is. But before we go there, I want to go back to this first encounter between Abraham, or Abram as he's then called, and El Shaddai and find out what's going on there. He has this encounter and Yahweh slash El Shaddai says to Abraham, walk before me, walk before my face and be blameless. But who's blaming? Nobody mentioned blame. What the entity is saying, walk before me and don't do anything wrong in my sight. Walk before me and don't put a foot wrong. And so I think the idea that God requires perfection of us, which has been sown into so much of our religion, the root of that lies here. In Abraham's relationship with this entity, El Shaddai, who says, walk before me and don't put a foot wrong. Don't make any mistakes. But again, we've seen this is actually not a conversation with Almighty God. It's a conversation with an entity. Walk before me and be blameless. And so there is that shadow in the relationship there, which I think reflects in the shadow in our concept of God through the ages. He then does make a promise. And he says, I will multiply you exceedingly greatly. 
And this promise follows on through the story of the Hebrew Scriptures. So let's go to the next occurrence of the name El Shaddai. The next occurrence is in Genesis 28, when Isaac invokes the blessing spoken over his father Abraham as a blessing over his own son Jacob. And he says this, And Isaac called to Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said, Take yourself a wife from there, from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother, and may El Shaddai bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you. So this relationship with a promise between Abraham and El Shaddai is being invoked over his family line through the generations. So the jurisdiction of El Shaddai is not just a geographical one, it is over a people group. And this goes back to what we saw in the episode with Elion, where the most senior of the Elohim is parceling out people groups to give to the different powerful ones. This is the people group that El Shaddai will have governance over. And we could say that that idea is echoed as well. It's the powerful one who governs the people of Ekron, El of Ekron, the Lord of the Flies, as Yahweh calls him in a mocking joke. It's the people of Egypt who are governed by Achech, the powerful one of Egypt. It's the people of Mesopotamia who are governed over by the powerful ones of Mesopotamia. It's the Amorites who are governed over by the powerful one of the Amorites. And so there's that dual aspect. It's not just that the powerful one has a geographical region, but that he actually has possession over the human beings who live on that land. Now, that's a rather interesting idea because it's been repeated through human history that if you own the land, if you are the king or the squire, then you own the people who live on that land. And that idea goes all the way back to stories like these, where the powerful ones govern over their own human colonies. And when Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly greatly. But the geographic idea repeats in a rather dramatic way, and it really drives home the idea that El Shaddai is that kind of a being. Now, I mentioned that there was a question in our translation of that word. Does it mean the powerful one of the mountains, or does it mean the powerful one of the plains, the desert plains? That same question was in the minds of the neighbors of the people of Israel thousands of years ago. And it hints at the geographical framing being the framing of that time. And it occurs here in 1 Kings 20, verse 23. And we're reading from right to left. And the servants of the king of Syria said to him, their God is, and it's actually a singular, it's not in the plural here, and he's referring to the God of the people of Israel. He's referring to Yahweh. He says, their God is a God of the hills or of the mountains. This is why they were stronger than we. They have just lost in a battle against them in the mountains. This is why they were stronger than we. But if we fight them in the plain, surely not. We will be stronger than they. So there's the smoking gun. The Syrians understood El Shaddai to mean God of the mountains. That's why they won in the mountains. If we can draw them out into the plains, we're out of his home turf. He will be at a disadvantage. We can beat them. And again, it reinforces this picture of human colonies governed over by their powerful ones and the humans being sent out to war against each other on behalf of the powerful ones. Now, there's a funny punchline to this story because Yahweh takes great offense that he would be underestimated in that way. And there's an interesting ambiguity here. Is he offended because the Syrians think he is a regional 
power? Or is he offended because they think he can't beat them in the plane? Either way, he says, oh, they think I can't beat them in the plane. I'll show them. And the story rolls on from there. I find it interesting, though, that the same question posed by the footnotes of the New Jerusalem Bible in the 21st century, does El Shaddai mean the powerful one of the mountains or the powerful one of the plains, echoes this ancient conversation about El Shaddai or Yahweh being a powerful one of the mountains and not a powerful one of the plain. It reinforces the idea that what we're looking at, again, is not a transcendent image of God, but a regional power that is in competition with other regional powers. So this really is a dramatization of the result of El Elyon, the chief commanding powerful one, parceling out different lands and different people groups to the different Elohim. So the insights that we've put forward in these first four episodes around Elohim, Elion, Yahweh, and El Shaddai really do reinforce one another in painting this picture of our Hebrew ancestors' world, this world of many powerful beings conflicting with one another over Project Earth and Project Humanity. And El Shaddai is one of these beings, not an almighty being, not the eternal, not almighty God, but one of a panoply of advanced beings who governed over our ancestors in the deep past. I think setting ourselves free of understanding God as an almighty being is very freeing. And this is why I'm such a fan of the Apostle Paul's definition of God as the source of the cosmos and everything in it, that in which we all live and move and have our being. Because in that description, there's no separation. There's nothing we need to do to get into God's good books. It's, this isn't a God we have to tiptoe around. Uh, I love that description of it. That's just me. That's just my personal view. But I would say when we come to words that have been translated as God that perhaps shouldn't have been, it may be helpful to do as Mauro has said and leave these names untranslated. It's pointless to make it an argument that says, oh, Mauro translates it this way. Paul translates it this way. My version translates it this way. Let's not make it about that. Let's leave the names untranslated in the texts and then let the shape of the stories themselves tell us what the stories are about. And I think if we do that, then a very interesting ancient world begins to emerge, one which challenges many of our presuppositions about God, humanity, and our place in the cosmos. The final edit of the Old Testament of the Bible, the Hebrew canon included the layering of some beautiful and profound theology over the top of ancient texts. Unfortunately, mistranslating traumatic ancestral memories as if they were encounters with God is a choice with far-reaching consequences. Belief in a violent, xenophobic, hierarchical God has been used through the ages to justify violent wars and all manner of abuses. However, the fidelity which the ancient manuscripts have been curated in the Hebrew canon by countless generations of priests and scribes means that in our generation we can now return to these fascinating artifacts of our prehistory and ask how differently they might be translated. To find out more about Paul Wallace and Mauro Bellino, along with links to their published works, follow the links in the video description. Thanks for watching The Fifth Kind. Please subscribe and click the bell icon so you never miss out on new content. For more thought-provoking programs, interviews, and documentaries, check out our website at fifthkind.tv.